you just sent your design out into the world. Congratulations! Don't you feel like a proud parent? Wait, you protected the ports, didn't you? What? Uh-oh, please tell me you at least had the discussion about, you know, ESD. You didn't. Oh, no. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Jock Talk. The world is a scary place for our designs, my friends. You can't just ship something out the door into all of those unpredictable things like electrostatic discharge, clumsy consumers, damaged connectors. Sure, your design works in the lab, but unless you plan on only using it in the lab you need some port protection. My guest today is Todd Phillips from Little Fuse, and we're gonna talk about protecting just about every kind of port from high-speed data to power to, well, let's just jump right in, shall we? And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about port protection solutions from Little Fuse. Hi, Todd, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you, Amelia, thanks for having me again. Okay, so we're talking about port protection today, which is something just about everyone needs. But why exactly do we need it? And Todd, what are the most common problems you're seeing in this space? Well, quite simply, ports provide a connection to the outside world. And primarily that's for a device looking for data or power. And what it does is essentially create an opening that becomes an easy entry point for some sort of electrical stress. And that's what we are seeing here on the slide. So common points of electrical stress would be things like lightning strikes to a power line that may be traveling down the power line itself and into the device, or it could even strike nearby and induce a voltage spike on the power or even the data lines that needs to be protected. Another type would be static electricity. In our world, we could refer to it as ESD or electrostatic discharge. Commonly comes from human touch. You know, we ourselves become the source of electrical stress and that can actually damage sensitive electronics. Another type would be short circuits, commonly caused by things like a power cross. So a power line actually faulting into a data line or a power line faulting to ground and bypassing the load. And that short circuit creates a spike in current that could also damage a piece of electronics. Lastly would be just general overvoltage events. These are things that occur on a daily basis from normal activities like turning on motors or lights and those inductive load switches switching can actually over time wear out electronics and cause damage. And, and that also needs to be protected against. Okay, Todd, now that we have this laundry list of hazards, what does Little Fuse offer in this space? Well, we've got the broadest offering of circuit protection technologies. And really, even though that sounds like a commercial, what it does allow us to do is remain technology neutral. So when it comes to providing the most optimal protection solution, what that means is that we don't care if it's a certain type of like a varistor or a TVS diode. We just want to make sure that the end customer's application is most adequately protected. So on here, and this is a chart that we've created that really helps to break out where certain technologies are most adequately used and most often used in those ports that we talked about before. So across the top, you'll see various types of ports all listed based on the data speed is how we've sorted those. And then across the bottom, you'll see two different technology types. You've got over voltage in blue and then over current protection technologies in green. And really what you see is a lot of overlap, really showing that for each various port, the type of technology, while not unlimited, it does have some options. And that's where we really come in to help specialize and determine which one may be the best or multiple types available for the customer. Okay, Todd, let's talk about circuit protection for high-speed interfaces, which seems to be all over the place these days. And one of the most up-and-coming interfaces in this arena is USB Type-C. So do you guys have any solutions for me here? Yes, yeah, USB-C, it's the, uh, as I've heard, the one port to rule them all, it seems, as we go into the future. This is actually a really good example of how finding the right protection can vary depending on not only the port that's being protected, but the specific lines on that data port or power port that are needing protection. As we look at this one, really ESD events and over temperature events that could damage either the, the physical plastic casing or even the electronic equipment 
the ICs really all need to be considered. So if we kind of look at this table from the bottom up, so from Roman numeral five, what we see is a ESD protector for the power lines on the USB-C port. This one is really optimally sized for a power line that can have up to 20 volts. So your typical ESD device really is only capable of about five or six or even 12 volts of sustained power. In this case, you need it to be at least 20 volts. So that's where the SPHV24 comes into play, that it can handle all 20 volts. And then when an ESD event comes in, it can accurately protect against that. So moving up into Roman numeral four, that's protection for the CC line as well as the SBU lines. The data rate is slower and a higher capacitance is okay. So in terms of data speed and capacitance, the relationship there is typically that the faster your data speed, the lower you want capacitance because that capacitance can actually degrade the signal to a point where it attenuates it and it's unreadable by the device receiving it. So on this line, since it's lower speed, a higher capacitance device can be used and typically is lower cost. So that's where we would suggest something like the SP1006 single channel device. As we continue to move up into Roman numeral number three, now we're starting to look at much faster data speeds. In fact, the fastest that you'll see in a USB-C port is the super speed lines. Typically could be referred to as like USB 3.0. There's up to eight of these that could be in activation at any one point in time. So this, in contrast to what you saw in Roman numeral four, this SP3213 really needs to be the lowest capacitance possible so that we make sure that those high speeds are adequately protected and that we don't interrupt when we're not called upon to. Further moving up our chart here into Roman numeral number two, we've got our USB 2.0 lines. So these are lines that are about 480 megabits per second. Not quite as fast, obviously, as the super speed lines, but still need a moderate level of protection in terms of not only how fast they react, but making sure that they have a low enough capacitance to, again, not attenuate that signal. And that's where the SP3530 is a good fit, where it's still low capacitance, but it doesn't need to be the lowest level yet. And then there at the top of the chart in Roman numeral one, what we're attacking and, and trying to prevent is over temperature protection. So it's different from what we've talked about in the other lines and really becomes important because overheating faults can actually severely damage the electronics that are utilizing the USB-C port. The set P device that we've offered here really senses overheating. And even though that overheating occurs on the VBUS line, it's its unique position in the circuit, which allows it on the CC line to cut off power when that overheating occurs and provide reliable protection regardless of what that power on the VBUS line may be. In this configuration, set P can go in a device just like the ESD protectors. It can go on receptacle side, but really today only on ports that are utilizing those USB 2.0 lines. As soon as they need to use the super speed lines, there are unique system requirements, which then would require that set P device to actually move from inside of a device to out on the cable, which we have some additional literature on, but we won't go into today. Okay, cool. Now, Todd, a lot of designs today involve some kind of antenna or different sensors. Can you guys help me out here as well? Yes. So antennas typically operate at very high frequency levels. So just like we mentioned for the super speed lines of USB-C, an ESD protector here needs to have really low capacitance. And that's a case where a polymer ESD protector like our XGD series provide a unique combination of not only the low capacitance, but as often is the case with antennas, they can be susceptible to high levels of ESD. So that polymer ESD device is going to be able to handle a high strike event like 30,000 volts potentially. Looking at the sensor inputs, so these are definitely increasing in their usage as more and more devices are adding sensors for just gathering information about the environment around that piece of equipment. They don't typically require very fast data signals, but they do often require fast protection because of how sensitive the control circuitry may be. And that's a, a case where the SP3522 provides a nice fit of not only ESD and moderate surge level protection, but comes in an extremely small package, which is as small as O2. Okay, so Todd, one of the coolest things I've seen in this arena lately has been power over Ethernet, but I'm not sure where exactly we stand with power over Ethernet today. 
Well, since it was created, it's really continued to evolve, really increasing in power with each iteration. So it started as just PoE or power over Ethernet. And then as power was increased to 30 watts, it became PoE+. And now we didn't get very inventive with the name, but it became PoE++. So it's now up to 90 watts. And really what that means is that there's more current and energy possible, not only to power devices, but that could be potentially relating to higher risk of a fault event. And it's this high higher power now that is enabling more and more applications. So we'll see this used in many different applications that previously couldn't use it, such as power of Ethernet lighting applications inside of an office building, being able to provide not just the power there, but also data as it may be necessary. So Todd, that makes absolute sense, but what exactly do I need to know when protecting power over Ethernet? Well, the first thing to remember for any Ethernet application is that really the optimal protection depends on where it's being used and the amount of exposure that that location may have to electrical hazards. So things like GR1089 as a standard provide some good reference to what testing could be done to select the right components and know that you have adequate protection. One of the tests they require would be a power cross test in the way that the circuit is protected would require a fuse. So like the 461 fuse can not only protect for a power cross event as a short circuit type of event, but it would also be able to withstand the the surge levels that are adequate for that outdoor connector. Side actors, as you see down there in Roman numeral two, kind of at the bottom of the slide, those provide surge protection on the lines that actually have the power. So the ghost power that's created on power over ethernet gets separated off and fed into a power controller so it can actually be used as real dc power and those lines are protected primarily by a a side actor and then in roman numerals four and five as those indicate additional protection may be required from like a tvs diode to further knock down or clamp that surge so that sensitive electronics can survive long term The diode array there that we see at Roman numeral 3 is SP2555. That provides ESD and surge protection for the Ethernet Phi itself. Remember, these are just starting points for Ethernet solutions. These can greatly vary depending on the Phi that's being used, how sensitive it is, and as I mentioned before, what exact exposure the entire circuitry may have to electrical threats. Okay, so... Todd, what about other Ethernet ports, and does the protection change? Well, it may, definitely. So for indoor applications, it can be as simple as meeting just a basic ESD level of protection. So a single diode array placed after the transformer, like the SRV05 diode array, can be more than sufficient to protect the Ethernet Phi in this case. As we look outdoors, the environment will be much more harsh and potentially have a much higher electrical hazard level. The diode array needs to become more capable. So something like the LCO3 would be able to handle a higher surge and provide additional protection. For additional protection on the primary side of the transformer, a GDT like the CG6, as well as, again, bringing back the fusing for the power cross, the 461 series, provide that primary side protection that would be required at a higher exposed port. Okay, cool. So, Todd, let's slow things down a little bit and talk about lower speed applications. So, what does circuit protection look like here? Well, here we really start to see an increased use of non-silicon devices. So typically, silicon-based devices react faster than non-silicon-based devices. And so for slower data speed ports, as well as less sensitive ICs, this becomes something that is now attractive to use, like using a multi-layer varistor, as we show here, the MLA series can provide a good option for ESD protection because really the speed is only about as fast as you can type, like in the case of a keypad. If we were to look over at the battery protection, this is actually a port that's not external, but actually internal to a device. These can still suffer from voltage or current stress events. And in this case, if you have a small PPTC or fuse, like we show here at the 435, can provide that over current protection, while the diode array the SP3019 can provide that ESD protection to the power lines and the control lines in a single device. Okay, so Todd, what about RS-485? Do you guys have any protection solutions in this space? Yes, we do. So similar as I talked about for Ethernet protection, the protection of an RS-485 line definitely varies by, again, the exposure level. So it's not just a one-size-fits-all or starts-for-all. For an indoor or intra-building application, a PPTC and diode array combination will provide sufficient overcurrent 
and over voltage protection. But if the port connects to a rooftop unit like an HVAC condenser unit, the PPTC would remain and still provide over current protection. But now what you see is coordinated protection scheme with GDTs and side actors. And now the PTC not only provides over current protection, but it also acts as a coordinating element between those GDTs and the side actors to ensure that they fire at the right times and provide the accurate level of protection that's required for something like that HVAC unit to be able to communicate and make sure it turns on and cools the factory floor accurately. That makes sense. So Todd, what are some of the other interfaces you mentioned at the beginning, like CAN, LIN, BUS, or SIM, or MicroSIM? Yeah, all of the above are definitely still requiring protection. And the requirements don't change a whole lot, but there's a couple of unique things that we do need to look at, especially for connections like CAN and LINBUS, which have become very popular in automotive applications. And as automotive electronics or use of electronics in automotive has increased, so has the prevalence of CAN and LINBUS. And the unique thing here is to remember that these are automotive applications. So it's not just a standard catalog part that you could use in a throwaway electronics item, it's not going to be good enough for what needs to be used in an automotive application. So the key thing to look out for here are parts that have passed the rigorous standards of AECQ and its series of standard tests. In this case, for ESD protection, the AQ24 CAN A is a great part because it meets that AECQ 101 qualified specification, as well as providing its primary purpose, which is low clamping voltage and leakage current. The SIM sockets, while not incredibly sophisticated in terms of being new or exciting, still require protection. And in this case, it's one that's very familiar to many, but we do like to still mention these because we don't want to overlook some of the areas that are too familiar. And in this case, this is one where multiple single devices may not be necessary. A single device itself with multiple channels like the SP1001-05 could be a really good part because it's a single part providing protection for multiple multiple channels all at once. All right, Todd. So what about power only ports? Can I use the same protection as a USB port? Well, no, (laughs) quite simply put. So an AC port, it typically has the highest level of hazard potentials of any type of input port. And this is where we really see the prevalence of fuses and varistors primarily being used. The exact sizing of those devices varies depending on how much power or exactly what you want to plug into. So you're not going to see the same protection on something plugging into your wall at home as a motor may need in a factory. But the elements and the basics still remain and are equivalent. For most electronic equipment, a cartridge or cylindrical fuse is definitely sufficient to provide overcurrent protection. Something like the 313 series where it has enough current carrying capability that it's not going to disrupt the power when you don't want it to. In that same relationship, it's not going to nuisance trip due to surge events, but it also, when it does need to react, it provides a high enough level of short circuit current braking capacity that it will safely interrupt when you need it to. So the varistor is the first line of defense against voltage transient. So it needs to combine a good balance of high surge capability, speed to react to that surge event, and be small enough and cost effective enough to be placed in the circuit. So that's where the Ultramov comes into play, doing a very good job of reacting when it needs to and clamping to the right level of protection for whatever may be downstream on that power line. So what about DC, Todd? So a DC input is very similar. It just has different options depending on the power levels as what you would see on the AC. It could be as simple as a TVS diode for just surge protection, as you see there, for like a 12 or 24 volt input, all the way to using something a little bit more complicated, but very comparable to the AC input protection. This time it would be the surge protection provided by a diode array, like the SP11 there, but the overcurrent protection rather than a one-time fuse. What may be used is a resettable PTC that what this would indicate is that it's a circuit that would need overcurrent protection more than just one time. So it's something that you wouldn't want to necessarily replace that fuse or even have access to replacing that fuse time and time again. Okay. So Todd, if I need more information about all the different flavors of port protection, where would I go? And do you guys have any additional resources for me? Yes. So everything that we've seen here is available on our website. So the breakout of port protection by individual port, as well as additional ports. So some that we did not cover here today are all included in that guide. And then if the selection needs to go beyond this first 
level of options. We offer the tools to further select that part so you can get into the granular nature of selecting the right PTC or a specific TVS diode for an application that may not exactly fit the general requirements of what we laid out. So there may be some unique aspects for a particular design that that we'd be able to cover through those tools. Now, since Chalk Talk is a global show, are you guys supporting people throughout the world? Yes, absolutely. We have sales teams and engineering teams, local FAE support located throughout the globe. And it's just a matter of actually on our website, you can find a number if they don't have it, but definitely feel free to reach out to those folks that are there and available to support any design activity going on locally. Okay, Todd. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. All right. Thank you, Amelia. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about port protection solutions from Little Fuse. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal. 